I'm Bishop Peter Moran, and I was on the Blair staff from 1964 until the college closed in 86, and then I remained on at Blair's, not as member of staff, but as a kind of administrator, because I was also the parish priest of the Blair's parish. Okay, thank you. And my name is uh, Ian Forbes, and we're interviewing Bishop Peter in for shows, and the date today is the 26th of November uh, 2022, and we do have your permission to interview you for the purposes of a history of Blair's College. Yes, correct. Thank you. So the first question um, is one which uh, might go way, way back, decades obviously. Uh, when did you first hear about Blair's? I first heard about Blair's when my mother was talking about her brothers, two of whom were priests, both of whom had been students in Blair's. I don't know how exactly when that would be, but certainly not later than about 1945. Um, so, so you weren't a Blair student yourself, so, so why not? I was not a Blair student because, this is the background, as was normal in those days, the parish priest had arranged an announcement in the parish church in Glasgow, round about the month of May, that those wishing to be considered for Blair's should now approach and make application. When we got back from church, I said to my parents, particularly my mother, because she knew Blair's, um, well, shouldn't I be applying? Because it was already in my mind, and they knew, my parents knew, that I was hoping to become a priest. And my mother said, no, we think you should not go we think you should continue at school, which was St. Aloysius College in Glasgow, until you finish your school course. So I said, all right. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that's the thing. I mean, now, nowadays that's exactly what everybody would say and that's why junior seminaries disappeared, I suppose. So you, you joined the staff in, in 1964. Uh, so, you know, what do you think brought that about? You know, what, was, what was the whole process? Well, I'm not aware of any process. I can certainly tell you that while I was still a student in Rome, and I think a few weeks before my ordination as a priest, in other words, in February or March 1959, some bishops came to Rome to visit the college and they interviewed me and said um, we, well the Glasgow Archbishop said uh, I intend you to go to Blair's to train to, no that's not correct, sorry, I intend you to go to the University of Glasgow to take a degree with a view to being appointed to the Blair's staff. Yeah, so there was, it was always going to be Blair's, not, not Lang Bank, because that Lang Bank was on the go just after that, wasn't it? Lang Bank was never mentioned. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that it existed already in 59. No, it started in 61. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, obviously it must have been in the minds of uh, people at that point that it was perhaps going to be starting. Yeah. So, th so uh, had you actually been to Blair's at that point? Then? Well, interestingly, I had. <clears throat> Why, uh, not in 59, but long before I went as a member of staff. Um, as a, an undergraduate in Glasgow, I was able to join a, what they called a reading party. And the reading party was located in a, a house near uh, near Edzell, 
called The Burn. Mm -hmm. And from there, I drove one afternoon with several of the other people in, in on the course up to Blair's. I don't think I told Blair's in advance. I just drove up. I remember that I was met at the front door by um, Father Bill Anderson, whom I already knew, and the priests at the time were on retreat. So we were given a, a friendly but brief uh, welcome, mm -hmm. and we drove back to the burn. So was that, was that the, the staff then that were on retreat? Yes. Because uh -huh. I, I don't remember that happening in my time as a student or later. Uh, that the priests, I mean, I remember the boys being on retreat, uh, but I don't remember the staff being on retreat. Well, the, certain, the, the staff certainly, some years at least, yeah. had a retreat before the boys came back after uh -huh. summer. Uh -huh. yeah. oh, well, that's something I didn't uh, know before. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what, 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 what were your impressions of the place then when you came up on that visit? Well, to be honest, I don't remember having any strong impressions Certainly, it was not different from what I expected. Uh huh. Yeah, because I suppose if you were used to St Aloysius College and uh, so on, and the scale of the buildings uh, there and such like, then Blair's, apart from being in the countryside, uh, it wouldn't be all that uh, different. No, I don't think any such comparison yeah. occurred to me. Um, <laughs> remember, I had said to my mother when I was 10 years old, oh well, all right. Uh -huh. And I was still the kind of person that said, oh well, all right. I had known for five years or so, from before my beginning of, for, from before beginning my studies in Glasgow University, I had known that I was destined for Blair's. Yeah. So uh, there was no, there was no process of persuading me or asking my opinion or anything. That's what I was going to do, so I did it. So, so when you were at Glasgow, with that, did that include teacher training? Yes, uh -huh. four years um, honours degree and a year of te teacher training uh -huh. at Jordan Hill. Um, the uh, female students were trained at Notre Dame College of Education, but male students had no uh, comparable place, so they went to Jordan Hill. Uh -huh. um, interestingly, when the bishops told me, when the bishop or the archbishop told me in Rome that I was going to Blair's eventually, um, what was I going to say now? Oh yes. He said, we want you to do classics, in other words, to study Latin and Greek for an honours degree. I would have preferred, actually, to do modern languages, um, partly because I had lived in Rome for seven years, and partly because modern languages have always intrigued me and interested me. So I said this to the Archbishop. Um, and he said, oh no, we asked the college, we asked the student, the, the school, and they said your strengths were in Latin and Greek. Uh -huh. So I thought, well, <laughs> that's what I'll do. I'll do. But when I arrived in Blair's five years later in 1964, it was my impression that what they really needed was a teacher of mathematics. There was no qualified graduate teaching mathematics. And I'm, I've always been interested in mathematics, uh -huh. but they asked the school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I think maths was always a problem because I, I seem to recall there was a lay teacher of maths going way back to the 1900s. Oh, the maybe. 1900s, uh -huh. And later on as well. I think it was always a bit of a, a, a problem uh, yes. for, for Blair's for whatever reason. Uh, but I think you're always associated with classics at Blair's. <laughs> by, oh, well, by, yeah. By, by many, many yeah. of the students. 
Can you remember your initial impressions once you joined the staff about you know just just the the timetable and the ethos that around the place? Um, well, the staff? first thing I would say predated my arrival there, and it was that I got a letter from the rector. The rector was the future Bishop Francis Thompson of Motherwell. Um, he wrote what I consider an extraordinarily welcoming, friendly letter, saying two things which showed that he was really thinking about my appointment. He said, to begin with, we will be asking you to teach a number of classes in Latin, but we, I'm sorry, but I can't offer you any teaching in Greek at present. And this is because the two priests who've been teaching Greek for years, and that was Tom Mannion and Danny Boyle, Danny Br David Brown, Dave Brown, neither of them had a qualification from university, but they had been doing their best and teaching Greek and I think getting passes in the higher Greek. But the rector said, I don't want to disturb them from that. It wouldn't be fair. And the other thing is, I would like you to teach some maths. Now, he was himself a mathematician, uh -huh. the rector. And I, so I replied, of course, thanking him for the letter and pointing out that I was very, very pleased to be asked to teach maths. So did you, did you get any training in that, or did you just...? Well, uh, yes, I think I, I arranged for myself that I would go on some short summer courses in maths, maybe a fortnight's in-service training or something yeah. like that. And um, also at St Aloysius, I had been one of three or four students who were encouraged to take beyond higher maths what was known as additional geometry, dynamics, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, because maths back in those days seemed to have a whole lot of different branches and very mm. often uh, examined separately as well. Yes. Because I, I remember even when I was there, it was it was maths, arithmetic, and statistics. So you got three O grades out of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. the yeah. statistics didn't exist, I think, as a Scottish Leaving Certificate subject at the time when I went there at first. Uh -huh. So um, you, you served under six rectors yeah, in, yes. in, in total. Are you able to sort of say something about uh, each of them, their different you know, visions for the college, their leadership styles, the, mm -hmm. and so on? I mean, <clears throat> you mentioned Francis Thompson was the first one, but you were only with him briefly. Yes. Um, I think I must have been one term, September to Christmas, under his rectorship. Um, I've checked recently, and I discover that he was nominated Bishop of Aber of Bishop of Motherwell in December '64, and consecrated, as they said in those days, not ordained. <laughs> consecrated in, I think, February of 65. So at some stage before February 65, he must have left. And uh, I think there was a gap then before a new rector was appointed to take up duty at, I suppose, after summer 1965. And that was Danny Boyle, as we called him. Um, well, Frank Thompson, well, first of all, my impression that I've already given of his letter shows you that I thought he was a very kindly, thoughtful person. Danny Boyle, I think, already had a kind of reputation when he came to us as the rector. Um, 
he was very much a Sulpician priest. Uh, he had trained at Saint-Sulpice in Paris, but he had also signed up as a member of the Sulpician Society. So he was opting clearly to be a specialist as a seminary teacher. Um, he had already been on the Blair staff as a teacher, but before my time. Can you remember what his subjects were? No, I can't, in fact, because I didn't know him as a teacher, you see. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but I imagine he taught French because he'd studied in France, and those who studied in France always emerged with a, a good knowledge of French. Unlike the situation in Rome, where we could get by quite well without knowing much Italian if we didn't want to know much Italian. I, of course, wanted to know, know Italian. I wanted to be able to speak it. Uh, well, Danny Boyle, he was only there in Blair's for two years. What I remember about him is, it's really two aspects of the same point. First, he wanted the Sulpician regime, if you like, to be reproduced in Blair's, which was fairly harsh on the pupils and very strict, very strict indeed. Um, one of the main points that I remember being emphasised by the rector was that students were not allowed to be alone one-to-one -one very much, if at all. In other words, there was a worry about the possibility of homosexual bonds developing. And the interesting thing is that in later years, it would be more homosexual abuse by staff or perhaps senior students, but certainly by staff, than two, two students themselves establishing that kind of bond. Yeah. Um, so the, the strictness of the regime which came from the parish, from the Paris tradition, fitted that, of course. That 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 uh, one to one, um, you know, associations or close friendships with just one person was always there, though, in the Blair's rules. So I suppose he was just stricter in yes. enforcing it. I think maybe that's right, or maybe he just was glad to find it there. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yes, there was there was a very interesting. Uh, you've reminded me of something that I hadn't thought of when I was preparing for this chat. Um, there was a, a very detailed Blair's rule book, but there was also, alongside it, a very light-hearted partial rule book written by a priest called Matthew Donoghue, um, who had a, a, very, a very humorous personality and uh, this second rule book was read sometimes in the refectory during a meal. I think it was a Sunday, Sunday lunchtime. Was it Sunday lunchtime? I think so. And, and I mean, it talked about things like don't eat with your mouth open and, uh, or um, don't, don't talk when you're eating, that kind of thing. But it didn't say don't eat with your mouth open. It, it said nobody needs to see your tonsils, that sort of thing. <laughs> Matt Donoghue, we call, he was called. Um, sorry, I've lost you now. Yeah, no, so that's so you're talking about Danny. Uh, uh, Danny oh yes, Boyle. Danny yeah. Boyle. Uh -huh. yeah. so, um, so, oh yes, so, there was there was a <laughs> an anecdote uh, which you and I have shared already today, um, but I knew it at the time. The the college had attached. A, a large four-acre walled 
garden. And on the north wall, which of course faced south, there were very ancient fruit trees, mainly apple trees. And they were trained uh, in a professional way against the wall and through the wall there, la there ran channels in the brickwork and then the, when needed, hot air could be pumped through those channels. It was known, the technical name was a peach wall although I don't think any of our trees were peaches. They were mainly apples. I remember plum, and plums as well, I think. Plums too? Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. maybe. Because we um, had them for supper occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> so, naturally, <clears throat> when the boys realised that there were apples available in the garden, which was out of bounds, they would occasionally go there. And on one occasion when they went, the rector came... Danny Boyle came um, and found them there and walked up to them, perhaps they didn't see him coming, and said, all right, boys, you're surrounded. One man said, you're surrounded. <laughs> um, it is recorded that they, and they more or less knew they had had it, had it you know. <laughs> The, the version I remember, or remember being told, though, was that he, he was actually on the other side of the wall, uh, beside the croquet lawn, and heard the voices in the garden and shouted to them. But uh, who, who knows? <laughs> well, that's possible, but my version, <laughs> uh, the one I've always heard, is that he was in the garden yeah, with yeah. them. Yeah, make, that makes more sense because I, I thought I would have thought that if they were, if Danny was the other side of the wall, they mm. would have run away. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and also the wall was about ten feet high. That's right. That's so right. how would he see them? Uh, he may uh, have heard them, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the so so Danny was strict with the students. I mean, what was he like with fellow members of staff? Uh, well, I think. It's just a f very slight impression. With me, certainly, his attitude seemed to be, this young man is a fellow graduate, therefore we are more or less equals. Uh -huh. But that's just an impression. He never said anything to that effect. Um, but uh, I don't remember him finding fault with anything I did or didn't do. Uh, you know, uh, there were aspects of my teaching which which were substandard, I would think. Not all of them, but aspects. I don't remember him ever reprimanding me or sending for me or anything like that. Did the staff in general, though, did they... Did they bearing in mind what had happened under Frank Thompson, did they ag agree with his way of, mm -hmm. of a, you know, type, style of leadership, the San Sulpician way? Or was there, did they just simply accept that and that was the way it was? I think in those days you just accepted what, what the rector decided. Uh -huh. Although, to be fair, there were quite frequent meetings of the entire staff at some of which we went through the entire student list, one boy after another, and anyone who had a comment, good or bad, or a concern, uh, was encouraged to voice it. Um, but I don't remember anything else about that aspect. Yeah. So the, so the next rector, um, was uh, James Brennan, who had been the spiritual director and procurator previously, but I think had yes. left for a year and then was yes. brought back again. <clears throat> he was so pleased to get back to parish work. And then a year later, <laughs> he was called back to Blair's. Now, James Brennan, Jim Brennan, 
What an interesting character. For some reason, I think because he just was interested in everything. He, when he was working as a parish priest, he had made converts in the parish because people got on with him so well for all sorts of reasons. But the one I remember is he could fix your television if it was broken. He would arrive on a, a pastoral visit to a house and find the old black and white television uh, puttering away in the corner with uh, a poor screen. And he would say, would you like me to fix your television? And there and then fixed it. Well, that makes a man very popular. <clears throat> when he first came to Blair's, he had had the job, very strange job, of being both the spiritual director and for the students and what was called the procurator, which was a kind of property manager. And as property manager, he would be ultimately responsible for overseeing the farmer who was an employee of the college. And the farmer in turn had a staff and uh, there was a herd of cattle and uh, there, were, there was at least one gardener. So the procurator was the superior of them. It was to him that they reported. And so during his time as procurator, uh, he managed and supervised improvement of the cattle buyers and the, the milking sheds to make the farm more efficient. Now you say, but where did he know about that? Well, all I can say is I've known lots of Irish priests who somehow knew all about farming. Mm -hmm. But he was particularly good at that. Now, combining that with spiritual director, first of all, he wasn't the only spiritual director because every student was allocated to one or another of the staff as the, his personal spiritual director. Um, the only exceptions were the rector and the discipline master. The idea being that if you had to exercise discipline, it was better not to expect any student to confide in you and certainly not to hear a student's confession. Um, so what did the spiritual director do? Well, he certainly had to give lot, lots of spiritual talks and um, Certainly, when, when I came as a student in in sixty eight, uh, the spiritual director had all the third year students. Oh, uh huh. And it was only when you went into um, fourth year you were allocated a, a member of staff. Oh, I see. And uh -huh. then in fifth and sixth year you chose a member of staff, and as much as possible they would fit in with that. Yes. Well, that's very interesting because I don't remember any of that. Um, I do remember that, I think in my very first year when I arrived, I was told the following students will be your, as they said, diriges, which of course is the French word for people under direction, and in itself shows you the Sulpician influence. Um, you mentioned earlier as well that we're in a, a house that uh, Duncan Stone used to uh, live in and take, certainly when I, again when I was a student uh, at Blair's he was the external confessor so the boys yes. could go to confession with a priest That's not, right. not, not on the staff. Well in my time the only one I remember in that role was Thomas McLaughlin, one of two priests of the Diocese of Aberdeen Thomas McLaughlin uh, was 
oh, very much a character. He had been a student in Blair's from 1905 until 1910, and he'd then gone to Rome as a student. And um, he was very much a North East priest. And his favourite expression was, I knew him well, Father. No, knew him well, Padre. How, whoever you mentioned, whoever, Tom McLaughlin would say, mm, uh -huh, knew him well, Padre. And one of the characters that he, he claimed to know well was ex-King Zog of Albania. I mean, I'm, I'm not telling any <laughs> lie. We were, we were sitting there. He would mention this kind of thing from time to time. And we thought, he can't have met all the people he quotes. So one day, one of our staff, I remember which one, said, in this, this morning's Times, he must have taken the Times, unlike most of us, he found a brief obituary of ex-King Zog of Albania. You can't get a, a title more exotic <laughs> than that. And we, he said, we'll try him, we'll try it out on old Tom when he comes, because that was his day for coming to hear the confessions of any boy who, who wanted to confess to an external confessor. Um, so after lunch, we're sitting having coffee in the staff room, and this priest said, um, I see uh, Canon, I see ex-King Zog of Albania has died. Mm-hmm, knew him well, Padre. And we're all trying not to burst out laughing, but he didn't notice. He just went on and said, yes, yes, there was one time I was coming back from the old Collegio, he meant travelling back from Rome, and uh, I went to Ciampino, which in those days was the only airport in Rome, um, and the seats in the plane were not predetermined. You chose a seat, and I saw this nicely dressed gentleman, I thought, oh yes, I'll sit beside him. Yes, ex-King Zog of Albania, and we chatted all the way to London in the plane. <laughs> that was Tom McLaughlin, not a member of staff, but the external confessor. Um, I'm drifting away from no, no, the topic. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. What, one of the other things with uh, Jim Brennan, um, as, you, as you've mentioned, was he had he was so good with his hands at, at building things of yes. one sort or another. So I mean, even even today, in what's left of Blair's, there's so many items that he constructed himself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I don't I don't know if it was during your time, but the um, the senior oratory, as it used to be called, mm -hmm. was was that built when you were there? The, oh yes. The, the present one. Yes. Um, the thing I remember about it was that presumably Jim Brennan had seen in the town of Cullen, Pamphshire, uh, I suppose, um, an, a very ancient sacrament house. A sacrament house is a feature of a church, usually pre-Reformation, where the tabernacle for the Blessed Sacrament is part of a larger feature, which is a kind of decorative panel, maybe six feet, seven feet high, two feet wide, set into the wall, usually in stone. Well, when they were making this, that big room into the senior oratory, in other words, the chapel for the senior students, um, a copy of the stone sacrament house from the old church of Cullen 
was comp that was made in wood and fitted onto the wall in that room in Blair's with a space for a modern brass, I suppose, tabernacle set into it. Um, I think that was a Brennan uh, initiative. Uh -huh. um, one of the stories about Brennan, to, to James Brennan, to give you the, a background, he had been, he was a priest of the Archdiocese of St Andrews and Edinburgh, and he had been, I think, in Kilsyth, which is just over the border of the diocese from Croy, which is in Glasgow Archdiocese, and where I went to school as a small boy. Um, Jim Brennan, oh dear, where are we now? Let's, yes, on his weekly day off, Jim Brennan went on, at one time, to the Kelvin Hall in Glasgow, where there was some kind of industrial exhibition. Stalls with the suppliers of machinery of one kind or another trying to get customers. And he found his way to a stall with a very sophisticated woodworking lathe on show. And he spent a lot of time there at that stall, so much so that the holder of the stall became friendly with him and he asked all sorts of, uh, Jim Brennan asked all sorts of presumably very um, well-informed questions <clears throat> and he enjoyed himself. He enjoyed that as his day off. <laughs> And some time later, after the exhibition was over and stopped, a huge parcel was delivered to the parish church house in Kilsyth for Jim Brennan. And it contained the lathe from the exhibition. And the explanation was the, the, the practice of the company, and perhaps of all the exhibitors, was if someone was particularly interested and obviously would benefit, then the used item, which had been used for showing purposes, was sent to him. And he inquired about this, and that was the basis of it. Uh -huh. The man on the stall reckoned he was the most interested customer they had had by far. And that lathe came to Blair's and was able to do all sorts of detailed work, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a strange thing with, with going back to the senior oratory, but what you've said explains it, having the tabernacle built into the wall, mm -hmm. because it's almost the, the last wall you would think the tabernacle should be on, because if you were late for anything, you came in, <laughs> on the altar. On that, the that's right, through the through the sanctuary uh -huh. section. Yes, you couldn't sort of sneak in <clears> at all. Yes, and it was worse than that because if you came in late and you were embarrassed at being late, you would probably trip on the step <laughs> and fall on your face. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yes. Because yeah. the, the other things uh, I remember uh, is obviously when the, the new classrooms were built. Yes. Uh, and he, he built the, the desks uh, there. Um, you know, or designed them uh, anyway. So, you know, they, they were all uh, uh -huh. done in such a way that they were in permanent position. Yes. The chairs just slipped in to the, the various places. I see. But the other, the other thing that I remember, and I don't know if it's true, but um, as a student, um, I remember being told that he was so good with cars and had such an attuned ear uh -huh. that he could actually change gear without depressing the clutch. Now, whether it's technically true or not, yeah, I, I don't have, know. I have no idea. I don't I mean, know. But again, it showed his reputation. Uh, yes, you know, yes. So uh -huh. all these sort of things. Now, you've reminded me that he was, I think, entirely responsible, presumably with permission from the bishops, for the building of what we call the new wing. Uh -huh. The new wing wasn't an, a wing. It was an additional upper floor on top of 
the what the students called the play hall, which was a kind of gymnasium uh, on the ground floor, which was used for other purposes as well. Um, and when that new wing, so-called, was being built, it was specified that the furthest room out along that wing should be a music room and should be soundproofed. And I can remember during the building of that room looking at how the soundproofing was installed between that room and the, the one next to it. And I think that soundproofing worked fairly well. But nobody seemed to think of soundproofing the door. <laughs> So that if you had, as in my time, you did have a, a small brass band playing in the music room, the sound came pouring out into the corridor and teaching or indeed study was impossible in the other rooms on that wing. Um, so uh, that was something we missed. Yeah. We we, we oh, didn't realise well, until it was too late. There's a person who was teaching in that uh, room next door, mm -hmm. um, at the middle room, uh, which was the geography room. Yeah. And um, I, I never remember being disturbed by what was going on in the music room. So uh -huh. But I don't think they had any brass bands uh, during uh -huh. class time normally. Might, might yeah. be more of an evening yes. kind of thing. Yeah. So the, the next rector after that um, was uh, Ben Donaghy. Uh -huh. who again had been on the staff actually for quite a long time uh, prior to becoming rector and you uh, actually wrote an appreciation of him in the, the Blair's magazine. Yes. Oh. Ben was a very... He, first of all, he was very small, I mean, in stature. But like a number of small people, he made up for this in the dynamism of his, of his own behaviour. Um, I mean, what, just to interrupt, I mean, one, one of the, the, the uh, things, stories told about him is that he couldn't reach the pedals on the organ. <laughs> uh, but I'm not 100% sure that's true, because I think he was quite an accomplished organist. So I don't know. If oh, he, yes. He was a very accomplished yeah, yeah. Uh, keyboard player. As a young man, before he became a priest, he, had, he was a pianist so good that he had actually uh, appeared and performed in the Caird Hall in Dundee, which was his own town. Um, yes, uh, <clears throat> and he had studied in France, just like uh, Danny Boyle. So was he a, a Sulpician as well? No, I don't think he became a Sulpician. That was something you could or could not, as you wanted, you know. Um, He was a Dundonian, though. I mean, by that, first, he came from Dundee, but also that meant he, he was a priest of Dunkeld Diocese. Um, and, of course, that leads to questions like, how, how was the staff of players chosen? There was a, a vague sort of principle that of the total number of priests on the staff, who at one point were 15, um, the number from any given diocese would be roughly proportional to the number of students from that diocese. So a small diocese like Dunkeld, well, medium-sized, would at most have two priests. Glasgow was expected to supply maybe half of the staff. And of course, at that time, I was a priest of Blair, of Glasgow. Uh -huh. um, anyway, back to Ben Donaghy. Uh, <clears throat> yes, he was a very, very talented pianist. He, he also, I think, um, composed at least one mass uh, that we used in the college as well. I think so, yes. I think so. Um, and when he was on when he was on the staff, his his main subject was was that English. I honestly don't remember. Uh -huh. I don't and know. yet, 
<laughs> I, I wrote the timetable, so I, I must have known. But um, no, I don't, I don't remember now whether he was on the staff when I was on the staff. I think I knew him only as the rector. Not sure. Just a matter of checking the dates. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, he... He... <laughs> I think it would be fair to say of him that uh, he, he had a short fuse. In a, most of the time, he was very kind and very considerate and very interested in doing the best for the students. But if somebody put a foot wrong, I think he, he would, for a moment or two, he would just lose his temper. And, and I think the feeling was, how can they be seminarians? How can they be students and, and, and behave like that? Well, of course, the answer is A, they were teenagers, B, they were not seminarians. Uh -huh. They were preparing for this for the senior seminary. And that's something that it's, a, it's an interesting sort of paradox in the Blair's history. Uh, certainly parents seemed to think that if the boy went to Blair's, that was him going to be a priest. Uh -huh. And of course, Part of the function of Blair's was to discover or discern whether the boy was suitable for the priesthood, and lots of them were not. I don't mean they were, they were wasters, the very opposite. They were people on their way to finding what God wanted them to do. Yeah. Um, but sometimes the parents had to be, uh, you know, they had to be taken aside by the by the rector or the farm master and, and told, look, it's not a failure if your boy goes home. Yeah. Or as they said in Blair's, um, R-A-S, initials of the Latin phrase, ready eat, ad, suos. He went back to his own people. Right? Yeah, yeah. That was the, the shorthand for this student left. I'm not sure whether if he left by compulsion, uh, the, the register said something different, like he was expelled, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I think the boys refer to it as domied. Domied, that's right, yeah. sent home. Yeah, yeah. Although interesting, domi, domi in Latin doesn't mean to home, it means at home. So, um, you know, as a Latin teacher, you would really hope that they would have said domum, but there you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so Ben Donaghy, mm, yeah. well, I wrote, I wrote an article about him, uh, which is available in the Blair's magazine, as you, the editor of the magazine, knew very well. And um, I knew him very well, of course. Uh, so did you take over from him as choir master? Now, you'd think I would know, wouldn't you? <laughs> I don't remember how I became the choir master. Uh -huh. But I certainly couldn't have arrived in 1964 and be told, you're in charge of it. Uh -huh. No, it must have been much later, and probably it was. Uh -huh. um, no, but I've already said I'm not sure if Ben Donaghy was on the staff when I arrived. He, he, he was. I'm, I'm sure he was... Um, so he was a, he yeah. was a colleague uh, yeah. before he was a, yeah. uh, my superior. It was probably because uh -huh. you were opposite ends of the staff corridor. <laughs> <laughs> Your rooms. <basically>. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's no, a gap in yeah, my... Yeah. 